It's a celebration here in the studio because the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast is a winner. Thanks to the Cybersecurity Excellence Awards for awarding us a Best Cybersecurity Podcast gold medal in our category. Yeah. We're celebrating, but we're giving all of you the gift. We're once again giving away a free month of our InfoSec Skills platform, which features targeted learning modules, cloud-hosted cyber ranges, hands-on projects, certification practice exams, and skills assessments. To take advantage of this special offer for CyberWork listeners, head over to infosecinstitute.com skills, or click the link in the description below. Sign up for an individual subscription as you normally would, then in the coupon box, type the word CyberWork, C-Y-B-E-R-W-O-R-K, no spaces, no capital letters, and just like magic, you can claim your free month. Thank you once again for listening to and watching our podcast. We appreciate each and every one of you coming back each week. So enough of that, let's begin the episode. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, I sit down with a different industry thought leader, and we discuss the latest cybersecurity trends, how those trends are affecting the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for those trying to break in or move up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. We hear it uh, in every other TV commercial, email ad, Facebook, promo post, etc. We're living in unprecedented times. Uh, the modern age of sheltering in place has changed huge swaths of our societal interactions, or lack thereof. Uh, and has led to new strategies for everything from work from home methods to live concerts, streaming live, uh, and often built on platforms not built for the purposes they're currently supporting. Uh, with so much instability in our day-to-day -day routine, there's plenty of opportunities for fishers and other bad actors to target the constantly shifting nature of our online uh, routines. And that means new and different attack vectors for phishing and other types of social engineering. Today's guest, Aaron Cockrell of Lookout, is going to tell us about some of these new COVID-19 and lockout-related uh, phishing attack patterns that are showing up and how to help us continue to stay safe and secure from online attacks. Aaron Cockrell joined Lookout with nearly 20 years of software product management experience. As the chief strategy officer, Aaron is responsible for de developing, validating, and implementing cross-functional strategic product initiatives that align with the Lookout vision of a secure, connected world. Most recently, he served as VP of Mobile Technologies at Citrix, where he and his team were responsible for the development of Citrix's mobile app and container technology while driving the acquisition of Zenprise. Prior to working on mobile technologies, Aaron drove the creation of Citrix's desktop vir virtualization project uh, product, uh, Zen Desktop, which grew into more than $1 billion yearly revenue for Citrix during his five years of leadership. Before joining Citrix, Aaron worked for Akamai, leading product management on their enterprise content delivery solution, as well as working on the development and deployment of many of Akamai's uh, advanced content delivery network technologies. Prior to that, Aaron led product management for OneSoft's e-commerce system, and he held multiple positions at BHP Billiton in Australia. He holds a BE Materials Honors from uh, Wollongong University in Australia. Aaron, welcome to CyberWork. Thanks. That was very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to let people know what we're getting into. So, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, we got a little bit on your, your work background, but tell me about your sort of uh, life background. Where did you first get interested in computers and tech, and, and when did you get into cybersecurity as, as a job and a calling? Well, from a, when did I get into computers perspective, that was pretty young. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm just telling everyone my age and so on here. My first computer was a Commodore 64. And, same uh, here. Yep. Learned, <laughs> learned basic the same and that's what, <laughs> same era. Yeah. Uh, that, so that's when I first got involved, got, got interested in computers. And then um, I guess I didn't take a direct route into computer science, but ended up in um, materials engineering, as you mentioned, working for BHP Billiton. But it was a really interesting uh, learning experience. I worked a lot with robotic systems and PLCs back then, Yoko Gawa, and, and, um, and programming in Fortran to, to operate giant machines like a cold mill that squashes steel and mm. working on in crazy environments like uh, they just had halon gas systems to make sure that the cray computers that we we're working on didn't with they caught on fire wouldn't lose everything and it was it was a really interesting time back there but um and things have changed dramatically obviously sure. um, but that that really got me interested in computers i think the transition to cyber security it wasn't i didn't actually pursue a career in cybersecurity. It's that every time I got involved in solving customer problems in 
general in IT, I would say everything, you know, Akamai onwards, one of the primary issues that we kept facing was addressing cybersecurity. So uh, especially like, for example, in Citrix, Citrix is not specifically a security company, but their products are frequently used in high security environments. And so I was always adjacent to it and customers always seemed to be frustrated that they were having trouble solving that. Well, that, let me say it differently. That was their biggest problem. Like mm. it was great to be able to help them with things like what we did at Akamai and what we did at Citrix and I think the, the, they're great companies, but I, I wanted to get closer to solving what seemed to be the biggest problem, which I think still today is cybersecurity, unfortunately. Right. So, yeah, so let's, let's jump into sort of present day. Um, how, if at all, has your day-to-day -day work routine changed in the last few months? I'm assuming it's changed somewhat. Uh, <laughs> were, were, were you a work from home person before? And if not, like what changes or concessions or maybe even improvements have been implemented under these emergency measures? So I would say at Lookout, uh, we have always had the ability to work from home and okay. entirely online and we're SAS, but both we use, um, online services for almost all of our productivity apps and so on and plus where uh, our services are online so we're very cloud oriented company and relatively um, modern from that perspective uh, though personally I wasn't originally a work from home employee I would spend a lot of time in all of our offices so I, I did spend uh, a lot of time on the road, or I do traditionally spend a lot of time on the road, both talking to customers um, and presenting and talking to um, people like yourself. So, which I don't know, we would have probably still done this virtual, but I do a lot of them in studios and that sort of thing. Um, so the big change has been staying at home. Um, uh, there are a couple of challenges. In fact, we had that discussion um, right before we joined. I think I need to invest in a better microphone and, and mm -hmm. set up for my, my home office, as you can see it here. Right. Uh, I don't know if the audio is okay, but it, I, I hope everyone can hear me. Mm -hmm. uh, I will be investing in that in the not too distant future, but that's, that's the biggest change. I think how that's impacted us is at specifically at Lookout for me. Um, we do a lot of, uh, what we've been doing is really pushing the edge of innovation in mobile technologies, mobile security. I'm really proud of that. I, I love doing what I do. It's, it's more difficult to do um, cutting edge innovation, brainstorming, um, uh, that type of interactivity virtually, unfortunately. Like I love, I love that we're talking on Zoom right now. I've used most of the tools for um, virtualized meetings. Um, and, you, and there are whiteboards that you can share and that sort of thing, but it's, it doesn't be actually being in the same room with a bunch of smart people and coming up with brilliant ideas. Right. Uh, at least I've not been able to recreate that environment yet. So that's, yeah. for me, that's probably the biggest impact. Okay. And you well, think that's... That and my dogs keep barking during interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're all seeing a lot of everyone's life uh, uh, during these <laughs> things. It's, it's kind of nice. I mean, do you think that's something that people will eventually get used to in terms of being able to uh, interact over a, a computer space versus, you know, I mean, when we, you know, we talked about, you know, e-reading 10 years ago, like people were saying, oh, it's never going to replace paper books and things like that. But do you think yes. uh, that, pe that there's just a learning curve here and that people will eventually get it? Or is there just no substitute for in-person in collaboration? I... <sighs> I think that two things will happen. Um, I definitely think that there's an opportunity for improvement, but it, it, and, and I do think that we will learn how to do it, but I think it will take changes in the tools that we use. That it, it, I mean, when you look at the tools that we use today, they're mostly focused on this type of engagement or more formal meeting. Um, like if you think about what you do in a um, design context where you're taking lots of um, post-it notes and sticking on a wall and trying to categorize a particular idea and that sort of thing. And I'm sure that we'll be able to solve these problems virtually. And I look forward to seeing the innovative companies that do that. Right. I just don't think we're quite there yet. Not there yet. Okay. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, we want to talk specifically about phishing and how it's sort of, uh, you know, the social engineering and attack vector nature of it has 
has changed in this present time. And, you know, we've had a few guests in the past and I'm thinking way back, I think it was episode 13. We had a guy named Pedro Mamini uh, from Inquest who talked about the latest fishing trends, but, you know, it's back in 2018 at this point. So, uh, you know, based on your own research, uh, how has the nature of fishing changed since this first major shelter in place order back in March? Has there been an increase, decrease, similar oh. number? No, significant increase. Well, let me put it this way. There is a significant increase in the targeted fishing that is leveraging the whole COVID pandemic as a tool for social engineering. Um, whether there's been a specifically an increase in generalised fishing or not as a result of that incremental step in COVID, I think that the numbers are a little bit too early to say, but it does look like that from, from where I sit. But you've got to understand when I talk about fishing, I actually am talking about something slightly different, which I probably should explain. Um, and what I'm about to explain has sort of been on a curve like this for months now, like the best part of 2018 and 2019. And what I'm referring to is less about, you know, the email that you get from um, some long lost uncle in Nigeria that left you a million dollars or whatever. Sure. More and, and actually not even necessarily email, but someone sending you a personalized message mm -hmm. that has a link in it that you click on. And yep. in the mobile world, what that tends to be is an SMS or um, not picking on any platforms, but a Facebook Messenger message or yep. WhatsApp or, you know, could be Telegraph, whatever, yeah. any type of social media yep. where they can send you a link and say, hey, if you click on this, you'll get something for free or you'll be able to see awesome pictures of someone or something or or even more troubling which is what's happening in the current pandemic we found that someone has uh COVID-19 in your office click on this uh link for more information yep. um so that type of social engineering attack where you click on a link now most often then the link is geared towards stealing information for further espionage or direct attack. So anything like your credentials for um, uh, online banking, your credentials for company access to your productivity tools like Office 365 or G Suite or whatever, which we see a huge amount of um, equally things like Salesforce, but also your, your personal details um, and personal credentials. And, you know, no one ever uses the same password for both services, obviously. So of that course. would be safe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's definitely never happened ever. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, yeah. I, you, we're, we're sort of getting into that, but let me just sort of um, talk on a on a larger scale here. What are the most common types at the moment of of phishing types? You said that there are, you know, there are links, uh, you know, within emails and things like that. Um, have you know? Uh, you know, um, and and that sort of like the sort of text story based things might not be yeah. as prevalent these days. So like along with, you know, click this link for more information, what are some of the primary sort of like phishing types to watch out for? I mean, are, you know, attachments and URLs big, are invoices, you know, fake invoices, docs, PDFs, like what, what are you seeing? Uh so in, the, in the mobile space specifically, um, lots around someone has COVID-19 in your office, um, yep. click here for more information, that type of thing. And I would put them all in a category similar to, like for example, we see horrible ones that say like uh, your daughter has been injured at her elementary school with the proper yep. name and the proper school name. Right. Um, click on this link for more information. What sure. parent wouldn't click on that? So I'd put them all in a sort of health accident type scenario right there's a bunch that we've seen around this is how you get your uh COVID-19 um uh check or your, your check, money yeah. back uh -huh. from the government um right. anything from enter your credit card details here and we'll send you the the money um yep. that type of thing um and and that's I'm directly relating that to COVID, but you see in a financial context, you'll see frequently um, uh, a link to say, this is, uh, you, you received this uh, check, uh, authorize the, the deposit here, or there's been um, untoward activity on your account. Um, and these are all financial. So there's been untoward activity on your account. Click here to change your password. Um, and of course, then to capture your password. 
um, uh, verify this transfer or, you know, um, someone's trying to send you money, uh, click on this link. But they're the types of financial ones. And they, they do a relatively good job of um, putting it in the correct context. They'll often know what your bank, who, who your bank is and that type of thing. Yeah, so there's some um, research involved. Yes. Uh, and then uh, the next category are along the lines of getting you to do something um, that you probably shouldn't do. Like, uh, and, and a lot of that is, uh, uh, involves business email compromise and, and, and impersonation. So um, sending a message to an executive assistant to say, hey, send me all of the company's W-2s. I need them mm. for some random reason and yeah. then the the bad guys file all the ones that have got to return and, and that type of thing um so or, or send me uh the hr database for this reason or send me corporate information of some sort so um i would make a distinction so they're the general categories that we see okay okay um so financial intellectual property or some sort of company uh theft uh you know financial and then the, the ones that are around healthcare or, or you know, personal information. The, those categories exist um, actually in email and PCs. There was, there's one that I would talk a little bit more about, which is um, business email compromise where, where you're impersonating someone else to get something. That in mobile, that ten, well, mobile is impacted equally by email since everyone reads their email on their phone. But um, there's also impersonation of like the SMS sender and that sort of thing you have to worry about on mobile because that's relatively easy to, to um, you know, pretend you're someone else when you're sending an SMS message or whatever. Um, there's another category which is less applicable on mobile. It's not completely, um, you know, it, it does exist, but it's more frequent that the attack on mobile devices tends to be click on a link mm -hmm. and that link more often than not tries to extract information um, rather than on PCs, frequently that link uh, or, or, or um, more appropriately an, an attachment in email tries to get you to open a package to install software to do something along those lines. And uh, that's not where Lookout is focused, but that's the, the, with the tools that are existing email phishing tools today are very good at uh, helping in that sort of area. But because laptop, I'm sorry, uh, mobile operating systems are less focused on that uh, processing of attachments that, and, and, and all the apps running in isolation. Right, right, for sure. It, it tends to be more focused on uh, click on this link. Right, got and, it. And steal info. Now, um, you know, thinking of uh, phishing attacks that are happening within, specifically within a work context, you know, the last couple of months have been a lot of, as we said, people have been kind of, uh, you know, improvising their new workspaces or, you know, clearing space out on the kitchen table or, you know, a card table or whatever. So there's a lot of sort of like just general instability, especially those first couple of weeks. Now, did you find that people were more likely to sort of succumb to phishing attacks during that because everything was so in free fall or was it maybe that everything was so sort of uncertain that everything that came across your desk looked more suspicious? No, the phishing attacks were far more successful in that period for a couple of okay. reasons. And, and I wouldn't say that that period has ended. It's continuing no, today. No, no, no. So, of course. So the, the, we're all still figuring this out. <laughs> so two big things that we noticed. The first and sort of the most obvious is Everyone's working from home. So unless you're operating 100% of the time through a fat VPN tunnel back into your um, work infrastructure, you're outside, which by the way has its own issues because then all of a sudden your home network and everything on it becomes part of the corporate network, which is uh, yep. IT security nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. if, you, if you're not using a big fat VPN pipe like that, then you're outside the corporate perimeter. And the corporate perimeter has traditionally had things like secure web gateways and, you know, advanced firewalls and so on that are able to protect you from these types of phishing links um, and these types of uh, content in general. So right now, people are working from home and their access to the internet is completely unfiltered. They don't have the advanced security infrastructure that's available um, when they're 
on premise using the you know the corporate network. So that applies to, as I mentioned, the secure web gateways and, and advanced firewalls and that, but even things like data loss protection and um, UEBA and all those types of tools that we use for monitoring for things like insider threats or, or inadvertent data loss and all, they're all sort of out the window. So mm. that I would put all of that in the same bucket as these phishing links. So that that's the first problem. The second problem is when you're at home and you have a eight year old that you've got to teach how to use Zoom because they're you know talking to a teacher and a thirteen year old that has a um, algebra problem and you've got work trying to go on and yep. your wife's got work as well and you've got one office maybe in your house right. Uh, you start working in uh, not normal working environments, and yeah. to be honest, and I actually sort of bought this here that your 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 tablet, your iPad, I've found becomes a much more convenient working tool than um, sitting in an office lot to, to a desktop sure. because your uh, your uh, I think it was Mark Templeton and Citrix used this this term time slicing here. Like I've got mm. sort of an hour focused on you right now, but as soon yep. as I get done with this, if I'm not on a dedicated call with a customer, I'll be replying to email and then doing an algebraic question for you know 13 year old math and then trying to solve a audio problem on Zoom on my son, you know, and it's just right. uh, crazy like that. And I've found tablets are far more convenient than um, sitting down glued to a, a you know, right. sort of work environment. So you're kind of taking are, it place to place. And they are not, uh, a, most in most cases, they're not company supplied. They're typically BYO. They're typically yep. unmanaged. So yep. that, you have that's any sort of new. Yeah, yeah, do you have any tips for, for sort of securing these sort of rogue devices like that? Um, the, I mean, because of the company I work for and because of my beliefs, I think the most important thing is to have mobile security on them. Like, so an iPad is no different to a phone for us. A tablet, uh, a, a, you know, Android tablet is no different to, to a Pixel. They're, they're, for us, it's all the same thing. So I would, and, and you can install Lookout or other security software for mobile operating systems from the app stores. Of course, I would recommend ours, but, but you know, it's a good start to have sure. that on your device uh, if your company doesn't provide it. Um, many of our customers, though, are quickly rolling out um, protection for more devices as a result of this. Uh, so we've seen a significant uptick in, in that sort of deployment recently. So if your company provides it, try and put that protection on as, on your um, the devices you're using for work is something that I'd recommend. If your company doesn't, go get um, uh, something from the app stores. Yeah. Uh, so let's let's sort of break down into. I mean, we talked about some of the the main sort of. Uh, appeals, especially things like, you know, your, your coworker has COVID, click here to find out more or whatever. But um, can we sort of go sort of syntactically and talk about like some of the language that's getting people to click in, in these types of emails? Like what is, what are some of like the emergency, you know, search term or, you know, the emergency sort of like hot button terms that make people sort of, you know, cause it, it, social engineering is all about, you know, getting you to act before you think, you know, so what are, yes. what are you seeing that are some of the sort of like successful uh, sort of writing straight. I mean, you can, you can tell, a, you know, a bad uh, fish when you see it, if, it, if the, the language is garbled or, you know, or just weird formatting or whatever, but like, what are some of the things that they're doing effectively that we should be watching out for? So I think I, I want to highlight something that you said there, which is you sh in order for, to protect yourself, you should not click on links or, you know, take seriously emails. We don't, grammatical click errors yeah. and, and yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> like just throw those away. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. A, that's a really good start because um, they are frequently originating from non English speaking countries. And so the English tends to be um, limited in, right. in many cases. So that's a really good tell that most people should take a uh, close wear off. But For sure. the ones that are most effective tend to fall into um, two categories. The first one is, Initiating that, I guess you could almost call it fight or flight. You know, my, my daughter's been injured like we talked about before yes. or, you know, someone's got some sick in the office like we talked about before. Anything that can, um, your financial, your bank account is under attack for fraud, your password has been stolen, your, yep. any of those things that, that would be a shock. And 
password stolen, um, even uh, your order has been rejected, uh, yeah. your credit card was rejected, um, your, uh, uh, there was a, an issue with your delivery, which is a big thing right now. Everyone's so, getting um, so many deliveries right now. Yeah, there's an issue with your delivery exactly. or, or you know, your order is on its way and it's something really expensive that you didn't order or something like that. Yes, yeah, right. that's a good one too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and like I said, you're, you're something really expensive and, and your credit card was declined. Um, yep. So those types of would make you typically uncomfortable. Um, that's the, the one category. The other one, I laugh, it's a little funny and, and it probably affects males more than females because we're very visual, but um, uh, we're all stuck at home and, and especially people that are dating online or something, um, there's a lot of these tricks to say, um, click on this link or install this app to um, have a more intimate interaction with me, mm -hmm. shall we say. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a common one as well. Okay. Uh, so... Um you know, we, we, we mentioned it with the, uh, the tablet and stuff, but could you give me some sort of overall sort of requirements or guidelines that employees or IT departments or companies uh, could do to make these altered, altered working environments more safe against phishing and other social engineering attacks? Like, obviously, we want to uh, put the right, uh, you know, defense on, on, you know, the BYOD devices and stuff. But, like, what, what in your mind is sort of like, uh, like a really good kind of plan of attack that, that IT departments should be doing you know, to sort of keep, you know, the endpoints safe and so forth? Um, that's a tough one, to be honest, because yeah. the, the and I don't want to seem self-serving because, you know, we're one of the unique companies that solves this problem, but the challenge that IT departments have is that the devices that they're needing to connect, uh, sorry, protect right now are outside their network. So there are tools that allow you to extend the corporate network into the home like VPNs. And if you're being attacked consistently through these types of phishing attacks, it may be worthwhile extending your VPN into, um, in, into your employees' homes. That may be the right uh, approach. Um, the, really the only, uh, that's really the only alternative other than having um, effectively the secure web gateway type technology, which is what our phishing protection does, which is blocking links, blocking URLs that are appropriate on the endpoint. And unfortunately right now, there's only those two solutions uh, available. Um, of course, we recommend the one being deployed on the endpoint because it means that the device is um, safe no matter what network it's connected to. Um, but extending your um, your network protections out to your uh, users if you don't have something available like Lookout might be the right way to go. Um, in that scenario where you're extending your you know VPN out to the, the home network, um, the... Well, actually, there is one other solution which I'll come back to. But if you're extending your corporate network out to, um, you know, home computers or whatever, I would try and encourage your employees to have it on a singular device uh, that's dedicated for work and make sure that, you know, obviously that the operating system's up to date and all the applications are up to date and that they have some form of security on the device and so on. In fact, most companies these days have some sort of Mac set up so that if the VPN is going to be running on that device, it does some rudimentary checks as to whether the device is safe before that connection is made. If you don't have that, I would encourage to set you to set that up. Um, so, so that's one solution. Okay. Obviously deploying something like lookouts, um, phishing and contact protection, uh, recommend that as well. Um, sure. The last scenario, having come from Citrix, um, solutions like VDI are amazingly effective in okay. this type of environment. I've gotten off the phone recently with a number of customers that are, um, reminded me that, uh, you know, I met you back when you were working for Citrix and Zen Desktop saved us in this scenario because we we're able to um, remote everyone's desktop out to them. So that's mm. a great solution if you have it in place. It's yeah. pretty difficult to spin it up quickly, um, although there are service providers that provide that type of capability. But what that allows you to do is have a full work desktop running on a device that you don't really have to worry too much about when it comes to the underlying uh, operating system and so on because it's completely virtualized. So they're the, I guess, the three scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, 
the the VDI one I know tends to come with a fair bit of cost and implementation yeah. set up if you haven't got it already operating. So the VP, VPN one and, and and mobile threat protection on your endpoints is probably a faster and, and more productive solution for most companies. Okay, so I want to sort of move uh, you talking about time slicing and sort of the way that people are working now, uh, you know, especially for people who are working at home, it seems like uh, you know, work time and leisure type time for a lot of people might be increasingly blending together. So do you have any advice for people who find themselves who are sort of always sort of at work? You know, you might be watching TV with your family, but you're checking email or Slack while, you know, on a tablet or going over reports while everyone's hanging out in the living room for family time. And I feel like that not only, you know, is a technical and mechanical uh, risk waiting to happen, but also the fact that you're sort of, your mind is everywhere. You're less likely to, you know, to check in on these things. And a friend of mine just said that he got hit with ransomware because he was checking his work email at 1230 at night. So, yeah. uh, you know, with some of us having a more porous barrier between personal time and work time, you know, what, what, what can we do to sort of be less susceptible to these kind of attacks, uh, than, you know, if we would be during work hours. So, I think I should start by saying that if my wife were listening in on this call, she would say that I'm not the right person to be giving that advice. Oh, really? <laughs> <'Cause>, okay. Because <laughs> I'm almost I'm always on my of phone. a hypothetical person out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Exactly. <laughs> but um, it's, it's really good advice to um, try, uh, especially if it's uh, even vaguely important, try and keep it to not, not so much work hours, but when you have the opportunity to think deeply about the, you know, what you're doing. Um, yeah, focus time anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, so I try, um, not that I'm very successful at this, but I try and deal with the, the more focused work stuff earlier in the morning, and then I tend to try and have a lot more social uh, engagements type things over Zoom uh, in the afternoon that just still work related for me, and they, they might go until later at night, and then... Right. Um, Wine and security don't mix very well either. So <laughs> no. keep that Sadly in mind. No. We've all tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, well, that, that sort of brings me nicely to my next question. Um, you know, with so many work and social events currently being hosted by platforms that weren't meant to support them, whether it's, you know, the aforementioned company-wide happy hours on Zoom or streaming from home concerts on Twitch or Telegram or takeout food or grocery delivery you know, which is often being executed by sort of new secure payment options or restaurants that didn't have, you know, takeout options before sort of throwing them together at the last moment. What are some security issues or red flags that we should be watching out for, not just on our work account, but in our, our newly shifted leisure time? Um, so, again, I don't like to pick on any particular companies, but I think we all know that um, Zoom has got dinged for a bunch of things in this area. In general, um, and, and we use Zoom, uh, like I'm talking to you on it now. Um, so a lot of these problems, um, such as inappropriate people joining parties and, and, and being able to then subsequently join work meetings and, and, and yep. so on, a lot of that's just simply configuration of the tools. Um, yes. This is... You know, I, I already am uh, a little bit frustrated by the term new normal, but, you know, if this is going to be our new normal, then become familiar with these tools. This is yeah. something you're going to be using on a regular basis. Set up a password for, like, I actually recommend that you set up a regular personal meeting so that it's you can switch one on uh, whenever you want instead of having to set up a schedule and a different number and all that sort of thing. But put a password on it and don't let um, people that are uh, unauthorized join it. Um, yep. You can set up things like waiting rooms and so on. Um, that that's probably the most important thing. Okay. Um, uh, making sure that you control who's able to join those. Um, yep. It, the the next thing, and this is it's not as much social um, as well. It's actually just general good hygiene. These applications gain access to your microphone and your camera and so on. So um, when be careful when you're having um, social interactions that you use tools that you're actually, that you know of. Like if you get um, a meeting request where you can, um, you know, have a happy hour with some obscure conferencing tool that you've never heard of before that's asking yeah. for your access to your microphone and your camera and so on, you know, question that. 
Uh, try, try and stick to, to at least the tools that you know, and that can be very regional. Um, and you know, you might come across ones that you haven't seen because it's a regional party or whatever it is. But bear in mind that one of the attack vectors is to gain access to your your microphone and your um, your camera and so on by installing software specifically for surveillance and. Um, pretending to be a social interaction where you're going to get sent beers or whatever it is mm -hmm. is uh, an attack vector that we've seen, and it's something that's um, uh, something that is pretty open to uh, bad actors, given that we're all trying to do you know, interesting new social engagements. So, yeah. yeah, are there any uh, particularly unusual phishing attacks you've heard of that actually that seemed insane but actually worked, like either before the pandemic, but especially now? Just want to uh, think of any of those. I know uh, I'm always surprised at how simple they can be to be effective. Mm -hmm. um, the, probably the most telling one that, that I think was sort of funny. Um, uh, the, you can actually refer to it on the Lookout website. It, it was called Viper Rat. It's, it's dated now, but um, it was targeted at a particular armed forces group, which, let's face it, are typically male. And that was, that was one of the first ones where I saw, you know, um, <laughs> maybe pretend ladies sending pictures to men and saying, hey, if you want to have a more intimate interaction, install this software sure. and so on. It, it's amazing to me that we watched the people that got hit by that literally on one of the important borders of the world where all of the armed forces were deployed. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Very, yeah. very successful and very rudimentary. Um, from an obscure perspective, mm, uh, most of the obscure ones tend to come through email with a convoluted story mm. and that you get you get tied up in the story. Um, I guess the, just for everyone listening, there's one other one that I forgot to mention, which is, um, uh, and, and it's particularly bad for um, people that are not as experienced with IT and, and often the elder community, which is, let me help you. You've got a problem with your computer or your phone and stuff. Sure. And it always amazes me how effective those ones are as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, expanding out from your company to companies that you might work with, are there any best practices for ensuring that any, you know, third party vendors that you work with uh, who might need access to secure information are less likely to accidentally or intentionally compromise your network and your information? Um, that's, that hasn't really changed in the um, COVID scenario. I mean, yeah. that's where you're sort of using digital rights management and control over intellectual property, those those tools. We're, for us, that hasn't changed because um, uh, everyone's accessing things the same way. So this is about implementing the right DLP, um, the right uh, potential uh, digital rights management on content, um, uh, not allowing sharing outside of mobile containers, that sort of thing. So for us, that, that hasn't changed a great deal, maybe with the exception of the fact that uh, it's not for us, the companies that are, that are using um, comprehensive use of VPNs, it tends to make that a little bit more difficult, especially mm -hmm. if they're perimeter-based tools. Um, so keep that in mind. If, you're, if your data protection is all revolved around your perimeter, and you're having people connect in from VPNs, uh, that, that's gonna make your life more problematic from a managing intellectual property perspective. Um, there's a related thing that I wanted to raise though, and this is um, especially in the, the healthcare area, which okay. is there's well, the healthcare, everyone in the uh, healthcare industry at the moment, I'm, uh, you know, we're all indebted to, they're doing an amazing job. Of course, and absolutely. It's, 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 with the added pressure, and I've actually yeah. got a few friends that work in this space, they're, they're okay. having to come up with new and unique ways to solve problems. Like we've heard of people building ventilators and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's, it's, it's troublesome. But, well, how do I put this? The healthcare regulations as it relate to um, things like digital protection of people's information, HIPAA, that doesn't go away because of the pandemic. So I, I try and make sure that um, people in the healthcare industry are, are using tools that um, do encryption of data when they're transmitting data and that sort of thing. And, yep. and that's a big challenge right now. So um, educating 
uh, doctors and that sort of thing on how to use tools that are make, not not compromising uh, individuals' privacy and, and, and their private health information is, is sort of important as well. Uh, but making that easy for them is what I would focus on from an IT perspective right now. Mm -hmm. um, we want it to be possible for them to work as fast as they can and focus on the patient and what's happening rather than IT. So um, forcing them to do unnatural things is not the right, right approach right now. Making it easy as possible is the way you want to go. Okay, so um, where do you see fishing going in five to ten years from now? Is this just going to be a constant arms race where it's, you know, fishing, counterfishing, fishing, counterfishing? Or, you know, is, and is there a way, you know, is there a, a way to make it, keep it from getting worse? Is this something that, you know, we think of like spam, like we still get spam, but spam filters have eff effectively sort of like removed spam as a thing that you experience more or less on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there any similar track for fishing or is it just going to be part of our life for, from now until forever? I don't have good news here. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it is going to be a constant arms race. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> let me give an example. Um, I, I think that it's going to be a wonderful revolution when we're able to get rid of passwords. Um, yeah. And we can do, let's say, for example, not picking on any particular company or, or, or standard or anything, but the FIDO alliance with um, FIDO uh, UAF2, the FIDO2 um, universal authentication is a great step in eliminating the type of phishing that I talked about before, which is where you steal a password and then steal data from a person. Yep. That's great. But you can guarantee that the bad guys are going to, once that problem is solved, then they just attack a different vector. Um, so I don't think that that's going to go away. And I really like that movie, Catch Me If You Can, and, and, and I've actually been um, lucky enough to meet the original um, Frank, and and he, he talked to our company about the future of cybersecurity and what, what, um, what he sees, and it's not a rosy picture. Like mm. the, the, the way that he described it is if you um, looked at trying to do today what he did back then to create, like, you know, he purchased an entire printing press to print checks of a significant quality, uh, significant enough or, or high enough quality that they could be passed off as real checks. Um, he, he, he literally took over an entire printing thing in Europe. Um, you can go down to Office Depot and buy everything you need to mm -hmm. set up shop as Frank today, right? right. Uh, so it's actually easier today in many respects to... Sure socially engineer and, and, and attack people. So sure. And there's, and there's like enough said, kind of hacking as a service things out there where you can just pay someone a fee and then they do, you know, either the hacking thing for you or they give you the whole phishing template and, and set you up yep. and everything. Yeah. Oh, today on, on the dark web, you can buy for 30 bucks a um, phishing kit that will give you the ability to um, perfectly represent a, a website like it's a financial institution for that right. customer. Um, with all logos and everything, uh, you know, looks perfect. Um, you can buy the domain that will look just like the, the right domain. Yep. You can get a certificate for it so it can be SSL. And the kits include things like one-time links. So I send you the link, um, you click on it and you're, you're fished. But the, the secure web gateway that's doing analysis on that same link sees a regular website. Mm. And so the, their, the techniques are very advanced and the cost of entry is very low. Um, yeah. So we see, you know, thousands of new kits a, a week. Yep. Um, so I'm sorry, not good news. Yeah. But I think that, uh, and we always talk about this as, as, as part of what should be good um, digital hygiene people need to be made more aware of it. The whole education, like there is not going to be a technology panacea that solves this problem. Um, it's going to be a gradual arms race um, mm -hmm. and we're going to have to increasingly teach people about it. So no, I, I, it's a shame, but it's just going to be part of our lives. Okay. So let's, let's sort of wrap up on that. Any final tips or tricks to keep yourself from these next wave of phishing deceptions? Uh, <clears throat> always... Like the, the first thing um, that we mentioned, bad grammar and that sort of thing, that's mm -hmm. an obvious tell. Yep. Um, 
think twice about whenever you're sharing um, personal information. Uh, the, uh, as recently as yesterday, my wife, um, we changed uh, healthcare provider, not to get into my personal life in detail, but um, the company called us and said, um, and started asking questions for personal information. And, and my, what, it was great. My wife said, I'm not answer, you, you called me. I'm not going to start giving out yes. um, personal information unless I called you. So think of that equally in a SMS um, email type world. Yep. Um, if you're getting inbound questions for um, personal information or, or, or corporate information or anything like that, be very wary. And that's part of the problem of email because you send people questions in email. So unless you know that this is a verified interaction and you have pretty, you're have you pretty confident that uh, who's on the other end, if you get unsolicited questions in email, in SMS, uh, over the phone, anything that's unsolicited asking for your personal information, be wary. That's mm. that, think of who, what you're giving up and to whom. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just like to wrap up today. Uh, tell us about some of the work you do at Lookout. What are some projects you're doing right now that you're especially excited about? Uh, I think probably the thing, and I know we've talked a lot about it, but the, probably the thing I'm most excited about is actually the the fishing protection because it's quite unique. Um, we we recognised. Uh, some time ago that as people start to work outside the perimeter, and this was before COVID, it's increasingly common that people work from home or um, work on the road and, and, and we're more and more mobile and things like 5G and, and, and so on and more advanced tablets and things are just going to make that increase. Um, as people start moving out onto these devices and working out from outside of their corporate environment, that protection of what they can click on and not link to malicious sites or, or phishing sites is going to be critical. And I think that that's really exciting to me because we're, we're taking a different approach even to, well, we're taking a different approach in that we block on the end point, which is somewhat unique. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're taking a different approach on is how we catch the bad guys. So I'm not going to divulge exactly how we catch them because that's part of our secret <laughs> Oh, come on, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't. We don't you, can, you can tell me. <laughs> I'm not going to tell anybody. We don't, All right. we don't analyze links. We hunt for new, uh, new kits, new sites, new. So we'll block frequently. There's a on our website, there's actually an interesting article. It's a bit dated now, but how we protected against a hack uh, to the DNC. Uh, mm. um, but, and we were able to take that phishing site down before it even got live, before, wow. before it got live to be able to steal data. Um, oh, yeah. So we're uh, very focused on how to um, catch these uh, bad actors before they do any real damage. And I think that that's quite unique. Um, and so I'm excited by that. Um, I'd say the other thing that I, I, I'm excited about, uh, what we're doing at Lookout, is we're increasingly providing solutions for companies to protect data on these devices. Um, and that's an area of research for us at the moment. Um, and that's interesting to me because uh, a couple of reasons. Firstly, people are increasingly working on those tablets and, and that type of thing. So tablets is a big focus for us right now because they're such a common tool for working, um, intellectual property and so on. And the way that you do security on these types of devices, whether it's a phone or a tablet or any modern operating system needs to change mm. as in on your work PC, the security tools can be very invasive and, and monitor everything that gets sent over the wire and look at what processes are running, all that sort of stuff. When it's an iPad or, or Android tablet or whatever, firstly, the operating system doesn't let you do that. And yep. secondly, you're getting texts from your wife and all sorts of things on that. So that would be an invasion of privacy. Mm -hmm. So I'm very focused from a research perspective on how to do protection of data in the context of uh, this being a personal device because we okay. see almost all companies having a proportion of BYO devices and a proportion of managed devices and this BYO proportion because of COVID just went... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. 
Okay. So one last question. This is for all the marbles. If our listeners want to know more about Aaron Cockrell or Lookout, where can they go online? So uh, the best place is lookout.com. Um, okay. uh, we've, there's a really awesome blog there that we have all about um, you know, security in the mobile space. The one uh, about Aaron Cockrell, I guess you know, your bio is more comprehensive, I think, than the one <laughs> Just on go Lookout. back and listen to the beginning uh, of the video again. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then the one other place that I would encourage um, listeners, especially that are focused on mobile phishing, um, is to subscribe to the Twitter feed Phishing AI, um, which is... Could you say that again? You, you, you sort of sort of squelched for a second there digitally. So what, what, what was it again? Uh, um, phishing AI. So that's phishing a lookout. AI. Okay. That, that's a, like PHI phishing. Um, yep. That's a, a, a Twitter feed um, of all of the latest things that we find, or not mm-hmm. all, but many of the latest interesting finds that we uh, find specifically targeting mobile phishing, for example, and, and, and unique novel kits and novel threats and so on. So um, we're sort of providing that as a service that's like we we don't, we provide a lot more data, obviously, to customers and so on, but that, that's a really interesting feed if you want to get up to date on the most recent um, phishing attacks that we're finding. Very cool. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a really, nice. really informative talk. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, that's fun. And uh, thank you all, as usual, for watching and listening. If you enjoyed today's video, you can find many more on our YouTube page. Just go to youtube.com and type in cyberwork with InfoSec to check out our collection of tutorials, interviews, and past webinars. If you'd rather have us in your ears during your workday, all of our videos are also available as audio podcasts. Just search Cyberwork with InfoSec in your podcast catcher of choice. And if you wouldn't mind, please uh, give us a five-star rating and uh, review in your in whatever you wherever you listen to us. Uh, for a free month of the InfoSec Skills platform uh, that you heard at the, the intro of today's show, uh, go to infosecinstitute.com slash skills and sign up for an account. And in the coupon line, type Cyberwork, all one word, all small letters, no spaces, and you'll get one free month. Uh, you can also use our free election security training resources to educate poll workers and volunteers on the cybersecurity threats they might face during this election season. For information on how to download your training packet, visit infosecinstitute.com slash IQ slash election dash security dash training, or click the link in the description. Thank you once again to Aaron Cockrell, and thank you all for watching and listening, and we will speak to you next week. 